a dog biting more and more frequently is really concerning. But what if your dog turns against you? This is what happened with Sally, who we are talking about in this episode of A Dog Soul, an empath's guide to your dog's feelings. And we'll see what triggered her aggressive behavior toward guests and toward her own mom and how we fix it. So stay tuned and have fun. All right, so Sally is a two-year-old hound mix. She was a street dog, but not for long. So she was just living on the streets as a puppy and then she got adopted and has been with her family since then. But in these two years, there have been multiple bite incidents with people. At first, it just happened occasionally, very rarely, as a teenager, but it happened more and more and more often, and especially with people trying to touch her head or moving a hand toward her head. But her mom just decided not to invite any visitors again and not to have guests, or to put her in another room and that worked for a while but then she started growling at mom and that was the point where she decided that this cannot go on any longer. It's really scary when your dog starts warning you to back off very loudly and a growl is a very loud sign, right? And for the dog it is very uncomfortable as well, right? Our dogs don't just growl because they want to overpower us or they want to see who's stronger or they want to be dominant or anything. Our dogs growl at us because they don't feel good in the situation. And for Sally, we found out that since this was all happening whenever somebody reached toward her head and not necessarily only when she had food, but also when she was just standing around or walking around or even greeting guests, we pretty fast connected that with her ear infections. She had ear infections every few weeks. And if you had ever had an ear infection, that's really painful. It hurts and it's uncomfortable and it's itchy and it's the same for dogs. Some dogs even shake their head so hard they get a blood ear. So it's really uncomfortable. They suffer when they have ear infections. And for her, it was something really frequent. And it became more and more tricky to get the eardrops in whenever she had an ear infection. And the more in ear infections she got, the more horrible she behaved. So she was almost impossible to live with. She could not go on walks. She was just hunting like crazy. She was chasing after everything that moved. She was reactive toward people and cars. Her mom was not sure if she wouldn't jump right into a car if she had the option to do that. And she escaped from her harness once. So her mom got really scared that day. And this was not an option to just leave it like that. Neither for Sally nor for her mom. Because obviously Sally didn't feel good, right? If you are constantly in these extreme stress levels and you're constantly hurting and you can't do anything about it, it drives you crazy. And her mom was desperate as well. She wanted to help Sally and she knew she couldn't hold her if she tried to escape again or tried to just get to another person because Sally was strong. She was a really large dog and she tried her hardest to get to whatever she wanted to get to. So this was a situation that had to be resolved fast. Not only because it was heartbreaking for both of them, but also because a dog who cannot go outside because everything's just too horrible doesn't get his or her needs met. And that diminishes the quality of life very, very fast. So this is something that has to change. 
And what I like to do first, whenever there is a very obvious health issue, is to address that first. To get the dog to a level where there is nothing itchy or hurting or scary inside the body, right? If we get our dogs to feel better physically, they feel better mentally as well. And they're a lot more eager to train. They're a lot more open to what we want to do to them. They're a lot less scared. They're a lot less reactive or aggressive. So that's what we did first. And for ear infections, I like to start with an elimination diet. Yes, it sounds weird not to start with a vet. But they had been to the vet constantly and it didn't get better. Yes, for just a few days and then the next ear infection hit. And ear infections are very often connected to food allergies. So we did an elimination diet and the ear infection stopped. Of course, during that elimination diet, we had to start training as well because this was something that had to be resolved, right? And she had to learn different strategies than to bite people. But it was very nice to see that she could calm down with her itching and hurting and stuff like that. So that was a good first sign. And it took a lot of stress out of that dog. The hunting got better, the reactivity got better, and she pretty much stopped growling at mom but she was still uncomfortable getting touched on the head. It's not like the dogs feel better and suddenly they just don't mind anymore. Very often, the dogs remember that things hurt. The dogs remember that whenever people touch them, it was uncomfortable. And that's why they keep behaving like they do, even though the reason for it is already gone. That's why we still have to do training and we still have to teach them everything's fine, you can do something different. And also, yes, it's fine when somebody touches your head because it doesn't hurt anymore. They have to experience that. They have to experience that more and more often to change the fear of the pain, right? Because they're afraid it will hurt again toward the knowledge that it will not hurt when somebody touches them. So yes, Sally improved with getting the ear infections in check, but it wasn't a complete win without training. So we started to look for motivation first, right? Because we have to see what our dogs need, what we can give them to actually have something they get out of training, right? That's what motivates them. That's what keeps them engaged with us and keeps them having fun with us. And for her, she was pretty food motivated. So she liked food, but what she really loved was sniffing and chasing. So the huge advantage of food rewards is that we can vary them a lot. We can do so many different things with just a piece of food and we can throw it. We can do a stocking game where the dog can just watch the treat and then chase after it. We can hide it. We can use more or less, depending on how awesome the dog was. And that's what we did with her. So we started sniffing games in the backyard. So she would get a feeling of what we're doing without too many distractions. We would introduce her to pretty tricky stuff because this was what came natural to her. She was a hound. She's a hound. So... This is something completely normal to her and what she learned very fast. So it was not too tricky to transition it to the outside world little by little. But since she escaped from her harness once, we also switched to a safety harness. A safety harness is a harness with an extra strap on the belly, a little bit further back. So it is still on the ribs, but further back. So it the dog cannot slip out of it. And we used a longer leash plus a bungee leash. A bungee leash is very flexible. It's something Canicross and other dog sports use for pulling. And it is really helpful if you have a dog who just bolts after some deer or rabbit or whatever. 
and the leash tightens quickly. That can just throw you off balance very easily. But if you have a bungee leash attached, the impact your dog has on you is a lot less intense. So this was something that gave Sally's mom the courage to walk her again because we tested that first. We did some rehearsals without the dog to just feel into the bungee leash and a longer leash. And for Sally, it was way less frustrating because when I met her, she was walking on a very short leash. So she could hardly move left to right. She could hardly go sniffing. And she was pretty much pulling all the time. If you have a very short leash, your dog is pulling very quickly. And if you have a dog who cannot control herself because her head is hurting and hitching and driving her nuts, it's almost impossible to do any loose leash walking. And most of the time, if you attach a longer leash, the pulling is a lot better. It was for her. She, in the beginning, she tried to run because she was outside again and it was very exciting and she tried to run after stuff and she ran left and right and completely crazy. But she calmed down very quickly and we used uh, sniffing games for that as well. Also, we did that in a very quiet area. So her first walks, again, were in a very quiet area. The disadvantage of those quiet areas is that you have a lot more wildlife usually. And for Sally, that was really exciting, right? But if you use a bungee leash, I would avoid everything your dog could react to. So the bungee leash gives your dog an extra length whenever he's jumping into the leash, right? And if you do that with a reactive dog and your dog like lunges toward a person, your dog has a little extra space and can actually reach the person even though you're holding the leash if you're too close. And getting a feeling for that is very tricky. So I like to use bungee leashes only if there is no danger of the dog hurting somebody or something or hurting himself. And for Sally, she, since she had an issue with cars, using a bungee leash on the street would have been really dangerous. So we did not do that. We used it in quiet areas. And yes, she tried to chase after wildlife in the beginning. And we addressed that as well. But with the bungee leash, it was not that big of a deal. We still had to address the aggression at home though, right? That was the main reason I got called in and that was the main concern for me as well as for Sally's mom. So what we did was first, muscle training. We have to install safety measures first. With every aggression issue, we have to have safety measures in place and only then can we introduce new people to the situation or sometimes even training itself. So the muzzle is the first thing that has to work and it has to be a muzzle that fits really well. So breathing is possible, drinking is possible, yawning is possible and it doesn't slip off and it's not too short so it doesn't put pressure on the nose, it doesn't slip into the eyes, all those things. Tell me in the comments if you have a well-fitting muscle. I would love to know because I think that's something every dog should have. Also, we installed barriers, so baby gates, in some doors. Not every door, but in some doors so that Sally could learn that she had to wait behind a barrier whenever a guest came in. We cannot expect people to always do what we tell them to do and not slip up. So. It's our responsibility to keep the dog in a way that even if people slip up and make mistakes and reach for the dog's head, nothing happens. That's why I like teaching the dog strategies way better than teaching the people strategies because there will always be people having a bad day. There will always be new people who don't know the rules yet and so on. And the dog has to have a strategy 
to feel good with all those situations. So for Sally, she was skeptical whenever people came in because in her mind, they were hurting her, right? She had made that experience from a very young age on. And yes, it wasn't the people. It was the ear infections, but she doesn't know that, right? She experienced pain in the context of new people in her home. So we introduced the barriers and targets to teach her she could get behind a barrier. She could wait there until the guests are seated. So the whole excitement thing is over. She could go to her target and get a stuffed Kong. So she could just take herself out of the situation, take herself away from the guests, which was awesome. So yes, a stuffed Kong is not possible with a muzzle. Maybe you have caught that and you were right. Whenever she got to a specific target, her mom took her muzzle off, gave her a stuffed Kong, closed the door, locked it and took the key with her. And yes, that sounds a little bit dramatic, but it's the only way to guarantee that nobody is stumbling into that room, right? And yes, maybe after Sally has made a lot of experiences with people not hurting her, people being nice to her, people being just normal people, nothing happening, all these safety things can go away. But first, we have to establish those experiences. We have to give her a chance to unlearn the pain-human connection and relearn positive emotions when it comes to humans. And that is something that is sometimes forgotten or we are a little bit impatient and we want our dogs to be quick with those learning experiences. But if we think about how we feel after having some traumatic experiences, after having some painful experiences, like at a doctor's office, for example, it takes us a long time to relearn nothing's going to happen. So why should it be different for our dogs? And we can see our dogs progressing. And for Sally, she was happy to go to her targets. She was happy to put on her muzzle. And she did not have that strong of an interest toward guests. So it was completely fine for her to be in a different room. And since she was is a pretty confident and independent dog, it was no big deal teaching her to walk away from mom. If you have a dog who is very dependent on you and doesn't like to be separated, that would be a different challenge. But for her, it was no big deal. So what I want to emphasize with this episode is to really look for the reasons why your dog is acting weird, why your dog is doing stuff you don't want to see. Try to understand why this is happening. What's it for your dog? And maybe there's a very simple solution if you just find the cause. And then even if it's not that simple, Try to give your dog the time he or she needs to relearn stuff. It's definitely worth the effort and it strengthens your bond extremely. So have a lot of fun training and we'll see each other next time. Bye.